Hello and welcome to another discussion for The Great Ordeal. This is the, oh God, I, st I started forgetting again, the third book in the Aspect Emperor series and the sixth book in the Second Apocalypse series by R. Scott Baker. Um, we, we, uh, today's discussion is going to be for chapters four through seven. We read approximately 100 pages each week to discuss here. Uh, with me, of course, I have the usual group of friends. Dan, would you like to start us off with introductions? Yeah, I'm Dan, multiple time reader of a series. Uh, glad to be back to discuss this book after I missed the last session. Uh, and yeah, I'm wondering what you guys thought about that. We'll discuss these very exciting chapters. Yes. Yeah. Done. Keep? No. Nope. <laughs> Not <laughs> your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Steve Go Swatha. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I'm Steve. I, it's my second time reading the series, and he said to talk about it. A lot of things happened in these few mm -hmm. chapters. Um, a lot of memorable, very memorable things. So excited to get into it. And I'm Carl, first time reader, and yeah, I'm I'm actually just finished the last few pages right before we got on. So so it's pretty fresh. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, I have to do this every time because Carl won't. If you enjoy the series, go check out Carl's no. book, Truth of Crowns. The links are in the description. Go look, go check it out. Go give it a read. I think you'll enjoy it. That, that is kind. Thank you. Certainly, if you like uh, tragic things, uh, yes. there's plenty of that. A little less of the, like, I, I, I would say if, if this is more biblical than, um, like, like the Aspect Emperor and all that, the Second Apocalypse is more biblical. I'm trying for a slightly more, like, Shakespearean sort of vibe. Um, obviously written in a more modern language, though. Hmm. With dick jokes and all, so. <laughs> well, that's very Shakespearean. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Shakespeare loved his dick jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have read little enough Shakespeare that I don't know whether to believe you or not. No, this no, it's is true. true. Yeah, it's actually true. People <laughs> people uh, teach Shakespeare poorly. They they focus on like how impenetrable his language is, rather than acknowledging that like one, these are like just compelling stories, uh, and two, there are lots and lots of dick jokes and just sex <laughs> jokes in general. Much Ado About Nothing is is a joke about a vagina. Literally. <laughs> Not nothing was an old slang term for a vagina, and so it, it's much ado about. Yeah, there's a lot what? of that stuff. If you if you look into it, Shakespeare loved it because this was popular entertainment, right? I'm sorry, we're we're starting off on, on getting sidetracked, but for any listener, yeah, Shakespeare Shakespeare was was a big fan of dirty jokes. This is a Friday conversation topic. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was just going to cancel today's discussion in favor of talking about <laughs> this instead. <laughs> oh, so everybody's gone with the introductions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. A, a lot happened in these chapters. I can't say I grasped most of it, but yeah. It was the Kellis stuff that I found difficult at times that we continue to have. There's a head on the pole behind you. There's a head on the pole. Clearly yes. that's, you know, I mean... We can start there. I think that's the first chapter we read. Yeah. It does mean something, the head of the pole. No. I trust random. that. Yes. Right, right. It's not completely completely random. No, for sure. But yeah, the first time I read those, those passages, I don't think you're supposed to understand anything. Like, okay. they're hard to understand even after multiple times reading. <laughs> it would be a really cool prank for Baker to pull, though, if he just, like, kept doing that and then never explained what the <laughs> heck the head on the pole was. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. The place called Kellis. <laughs> oh, the place called Oh yeah, Kellis is now a place. That's crazy. I know. This dude, he is just he is crazy. He he is crazy. I well, fully am on the Kellis's mad train. He he I I get that he drinks his own Kool-Aid, but like it's just absurd to me. It's I mean he said he's crazy himself, right? Yeah, that's true. He did he admit he confessed to it, so I gotta give him he has some yeah. level of self awareness. He said he doesn't know where their voices come from. Like, is it God? Is God crazy? Doesn't seem they're telling him very sane things. 
it sounds a lot like the no god to me but i i have held that to be true from the beginning at least partially i feel like he may be speaking to multiple voices but i may be wrong about that i don't know the voice for which uh, to which he keeps saying what that he's harvesting and he's reaping and he won't set the field on fire it's not specified that the voice is telling him that or if, if he's got that information from somewhere else i mean it's it's a conversation right between himself yeah. and a voice and well, they're talking is it or is just the voice telling him something i thought it was a conversation. oh you mean the chapter when he's talking with oh yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah yeah the there is some italics conversation yeah no, the correct. details of which i do not remember but there's some mention of harvest and fields and yeah how careless is the keeper and or he's the deliverer of the wheat to the god yeah who, who better to burn the wheat than the person keeping it right yes that that's like, yeah. it, like it sounds like the no god or or someone in the consult mm. you know like the the way of saying like i war with god like who else is warring with god right well yeah, I don't know what you discussed last time because uh, I've only just started listening to your discussion for last time. But um, I think he makes he's made multiple time distinction between the the gods and the the god of gods, right. right? So sometimes it's ambiguous what is what he's referring to, right? Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen the is it implied later in this chapter that the no not the no god the god of gods is an entity without consciousness almost like it can't be talking back to him yeah i think it pretty much says that it's like as far away from a human that it's like it's like an eldritch horror pretty much it's inconceivable by the human mind it's like a complete almost a complete opposite of humanity i guess Right. It's it's rather than us being fashioned in God's image, it's like God is like the inverse. Yeah. It's like a force. It's a entity. Some some yeah. Yeah, God doesn't want, God just is. Yeah. The descriptions are pretty, you know, pretty powerful. I I, I feel for Proyas listening to all this shit. Like, it's what? one thing listening to it as, like, oh, it's a fancy book. But if I'm, like, if it's real life and someone is telling me that shit about my real world, that's... Yeah. yeah. What what broke him is that... Is when Kellis tells him that he, uh, the god of gods does not... That has nothing to do with love, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that breaks him, among other things. <laughs> well, survey was pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah, saying Surway is burning in hell made me very sad. It's and just... we kinda knew that though. Right? We don't know. Is that news? <laughs> I mean that's what that's what that's what Kella says at least. I mean he could be wrong. I guess he doesn't but we we now know at least in his head he thinks he's been to hell. So he's been to the outside. Um so yeah. I don't know what you know the yeah. depth of what he learned from that. At least we get a confirmation, I think. I guess there's a description of him. Like, he spent time learning how to, I guess, go to hell. Yes. And all those other magical arts. Mm -hmm. so. so, when he calls himself the place, do you think that he's got a piece of hell with him, perhaps? Kind of like the dragon did? Is that why he's the place now? Oh, interesting. I was just thinking that he's just so full of his own shit that he thinks he's beyond people and beyond kind of this mortal coil. And he's like, I, 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 I am greater than a person. I am a place. But that'd be interesting if he has like, yeah, he has that aspect of the outside with him now. So I feel like mad as he is, he's not yet to the point where he would say these things to sort of sheer hubris. He must mean something by it. And and I don't even think he might be exaggerating. He might be saying it like it is. So what is it that he is, is the question. 
I like this part. I, 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 by feeling, interpret it as like he's the center. He's like immu immutable. It's he's around, like he's like the the place around which other people transit or evolve. Like he's not, you know, moving around like all the other people's he is. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Where people travel through, I guess, or something like that. I, don't know. I mean, part part of why I feel it is at least partly hubris is that uh, he is the only other being that he refers to or thinks of as it. Like mm. we were just talking about how God is in it. And mm. he starts to refer to himself in his head as it. And I'm pretty sure he even capitalizes it. And it, it's just to me is equating him with the God, uh, the God of gods and putting him on that same level, which is like peak Greek tragedy, you know, that's like the, that's like the, the classic hubristic thing. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, he is, I mean, he says himself, he does a whole description of like, oh, I did this, I did that. I, you know, I, I converse with the gods. I'm like, He's not like completely full of himself, I guess. He's he is probably the most powerful human that ever existed. Definitely. No, definitely. I I, I wouldn't certainly argue against that. Um he, he is beyond people in a lot of ways, but he's also still fundamentally like you know Yeah. His skull is still human, as uh they discovered, right, in the uh, issue all as as a Kamian and um Mimara discovered right is like a lot about the Dunyane's physiology had changed but still at their core they are human beings just maybe monstrous evil humans yeah on uh on page 124 it says um this that place where you are now Prussia this is the revelation and from that point on he he could, he's described as a place so I almost a lot of it like as a place of worship or a place of mm. like he's consuming like he's transcended mm. Mm. It, it unconditioned and absolute wait the place here is that the same as the place that he keeps referring to himself as I yeah. thought this was just place as in like this position in your thought process not the same as how he used the place earlier hmm. but i could be wrong i don't know that the god is not comfort the god is not law oh no sorry i was wrong what broke broest was being told <laughs> that akamian is the prophet you sought all along mm. oh yeah <laughs> that was fantastic prophet of the past i had to put the book down and laugh yeah <laughs> well, because Akamian is also the prophet of the god that would be the correct god for Proyas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he is also the prophet of the past. Mimara has been telling us that all yeah. along, that he is yeah. a prophet. That's really cool. I love the flashback we get to. It's such a great little... It felt very like cinematic to me, like something you'd see in a, a TV show of Proyas, you know, very symbolically, this memory he has of himself falling, right? Um, and, you know, being caught and a Kamian is reaching for him desperately, like, give me your hand. And he like, Proyas is so hesitant to do so. And he ends up falling because he hesitates too long. And it's just such a, a wonderful, uh, metaphor for his entire character. It's sort of distilled right there, the conflict at the core of his character and the mm -hmm. tragedy. Yeah. Why do you think... Kalos is doing this to Proyas. I'm still trying to figure He's that bored. out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I mean, okay, I, I was kidding earlier, but he almost has a thought in his internal monologue to that mm. effect, right? That he spent so long just like acquiring entire peoples to his thought process. Now he's working an individual soul down and he's not done that in so long. Like He, he seems to have a purpose for it obviously, but um, there's also this sense of like, I'm entertaining myself a little bit. 
maybe it's a test even like i i don't know like it, can humans you know go beyond this i i don't know that it was just one of the ideas that occurred to me because it ends so tragically and kind of hilariously in a really bleak way that Sapound and Proyas are like, oh, he's just testing us. Like, this is just all about our faith. You know, when he tells us all of these things, it's really just to show that we, we really do believe despite it all, despite even what he says, like they're so far gone. They don't even believe what their prophet is literally telling them to their face. It's, it's like uh, the life of Brian. I'm not, I'm not the prophet. He is the prophet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, it is. It's, it's just really darkly comic. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I loved all this stuff. I thought this was really interesting. I do like the sections of him talking with Salbon. Like it gives a lot more depth to Salbon's character. Absolutely. And like their relationship is also very interesting to me. I wish we got more of it, honestly. Yeah. I, I, even back in the first trilogy, because um, I do, I really like their dynamic. And Salvan, I feel like, is a much more fleshed out character here now. Like, I feel like I understand him more and I see the, the depths to him more than I did yeah. in, in the first trilogy. I, I really enjoy every scene he's in. Still don't agree with him, but... <laughs> <laughs> no. No, he is still uh, not, not the greatest person, but he is wildly entertaining. Yeah, and it's not as superficial as you would think from the first trilogy. Right, exactly. Right. And he's a great foil for Proyas, right? Like, they, they just bounce off each other really well. And they're, they're, the way that their flaws and strengths kind of coalesce is, is quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, who knows I, what I he's doing there. Sorry, go, Steve. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, after 20 years of doing Kallus's bidding, I think they almost feel like they have to go along with whatever he says. Like, Right, because otherwise it's like, yeah, it's all pointless, right? Yeah. We just committed all these atrocities. Um, I mean, that's that's the tragedy, right? Yeah. I mean, that's true for Proyas, but for Sauban, he kind of got what he wanted, right? He wanted, to, he wanted to rule a kingdom, and he got that. But, but he... Um, I think he had to, how do I put this? He went from telling Proyas, I was never as much of a believer as you were, so I don't really care that he is revealing himself to not be a prophet. He went from there to, no, you have to be lying because I, I refuse to believe that Kellis would do what you said, which means that he does believe in some sense uh, in Kellis. Uh, or like worships him in some way. Well, he believes in him as a warrior, as a person of strength, right? Not, and mm. if he's shown as like a a dishonorable, a weak person, right? Based on his mm. culture, then that would also like, who is he for following such a person? Okay, that makes sense. So it, it doesn't still have to be a religious worship. It's just no, because uh, they both want yeah. different things, right? So he's breaking them down in different ways. <laughs> I, I like the, but okay, I don't like it, but it, it was kind of interesting, the two birds in one shot that he did with Callis and Proyas. Yeah, I mean, is that why, is that why he sodomizes Proyas? Or is, is there something else? That's why. I mean, it's I was, fucked up. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, I, I don't, other than just like, to break him even more, I, I, I don't understand what's going on there. Yeah. Is we had this um do I remember correctly that in the first series Proes uh had feelings for some men that he was interacting with. And I think Moengus not Moengus, sorry, the Silvendi, what was his name? Nayar was one of them. Did he? And I think I'm I think it's the reverse. Okay. I think Nayer was kinda had the hot mm. for Proyas a bit. He he like all would talk about how like supple his lips were and like things like that. <laughs> did did we get the sense that Proyas reciprocated a little bit, like but it was still forbidden? Am I completely making that up? It... I don't remember I don't... if that, if that is. Okay, no, I don't. Know. Um, I feel like there was a scene in which Proyas noticed him too, but didn't really acknowledge it for what it was. Like notice Nair. A similar way perhaps but 
I I don't Maybe know if, if I'm misremembering that. But if that is true, I wonder if Kellis is doing more of like I do not like how he did it, but this is your true nature revelation to Proyas. Mm. But I don't understand the purpose of that in the face of all else he is being told. He does talk about right that or or think about Kellis uh that like to 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 remake a, a man you have to like bring out the child in him and so i feel like that has to be part of it and so i i was like trying to think like you know what was proyas have we had hints that he was molested as a kid like what why is why is he doing that you know cuz i i'll admit my first instinct was just like really like where are we going here? Like, what? What's the purpose? This is. Are you just doing this for shock factor? Like, I feel like it's intentional, like very deliberate. There's like a something here, but I I don't remember Proyas. Like, I don't think not so. the same illusions, you know, um, that we've had with other characters. Um, I thought maybe it was also just like, again, like asserting dominance. I'm like, well, I just told you all this stuff. Uh, about how I'm not re your real prophet, but I'm still gonna do whatever I want with you. And you're and you're just gonna, you know, follow me anyways. I don't know. It's uh, right. Mind games. Yeah. Just forever just breaking his psyche or yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah. It to me like unless it's touching on something very specific in Proyas, mm. then. It, it it does feel a little like extraneous to me like i i don't know you know that that he needed to be sodomized to yeah, like maybe. he was already pretty psychologically broken like i if 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 you cut out that scene i would have still believed the rest of the chapter you know and how Proyas reacts but yeah. i again it's it's tough to say without knowing what kellis is like specifically going for here like i said it helps for the Saubon part mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it that that seems to be why Proyas thinks um, Kellis did, um, but we don't know if that's true. Don't know anything. We don't know anything. No. <laughs> and that's what we yeah. should worship. Yeah. Any? Yeah, that's right. Worship ignorance. <laughs> uh, Varsha, do you have any additional thoughts about the head on the pole behind him? I had a, I had one thought. You know how later the um, what they see about the Dunian completely horrifies Akamian and Mimara, how just uh intellect without compassion, what it makes of the men they see. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the head on the pole is a bit of a metaphor or parallel to that like because it's just the head with nothing else mm. so is the head supposed mm. to be representative of intellect um or just in its purified form and that's what is speaking to Kellis somehow um but i don't but then it also comes up as what Kellis found in his wanderings what made him the thing that wait let me find that again the most dominant thing in the world at the moment uh, or place in the world at the moment um what precedes that is that paragraph in which he waxes eloquent about how he's uh the center of existence right now the line just before that was how he found the head on the pole so i think it has to be a lot more than just the metaphor with intellect but I don't know what it is yet. We talked last time about how it could maybe be some form of the no god, but I still don't know what the connection might be there. Did you have something, Carl? Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I I I feel increasingly that it is in some way connected to the no god. Hmm. I just don't know exactly how. I do feel like we're going to see explicitly a head on a pole behind him, at some point. Like, I mean, for all I fucking know, it's Kelsey a vision of, like, him, you know? Like, I don't know. You know, it's he, his head gets put on a pole at the end of this 
thing. I, I, I don't know. So do you think that those sections are like, they're going to happen in the future, but haven't happened yet? A lot of his visions seem to be that way, mm -hmm. um, to be tied to the future. So that's what made me think that. But mm -hmm. I mean, the behind him is interesting because that could be, you know, behind him chronologically that there there is a head on a pole in his past. Mm -hmm. But I don't know where or what that means. <laughs> and, and it's hard to guess. Other than, again, I feel like it just seems very ominous and uh there's a lot of destructive energy uh and uh not energy um phrasing language around uh those passages and so i do wonder you know it just makes me think no god but i'm not sure i mean maybe maybe it's a uh, a different you know a red herring hmm i do you have thoughts on like who is talking back to him um i think in the beginning um there is something in the description oh yeah uh yes it it stands before him regards him as it has so many times with his face and his eyes no halo gilds his leonine mane so are we to think that this is whatever it is that's talking to Kellis is wearing his own face. Plus, when he tells Proist that there was a voice in his head that was telling him what to do, and he started taking the orders there, Proist asked him if he was, if it was himself that was talking to him. I think Proist wanted that to be a comfort to him, <laughs> that this is still the God. But based on this description in the beginning, um, that might be true, but not necessarily what Proyas is thinking of it. Maybe it's some sort of skin spy. Sorry, say that again? Maybe it's some sort of skin spy. That's why he looks like him. Possibly. Like, the no god. Could it... I, I mean, I know. I, I don't think it's a skin spy. I, 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 it's definitely some sort of divinity, but I, I don't know. You know... <laughs> If it's not the no god, it's one of the gods, I think. I don't know, or I don't know, we've been introduced now into this book properly to the like big evil consult lead, like fucking Sauron or whatever the fuck this dude yeah. is, you know. Um, so it could be him, I don't know, reaching out into dreams, visions. I don't know how he would do that. Um, but I, my, 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 gut instinct is it's the no god but maybe maybe not Kellis definitely had visions of the no god in the first trilogy like he, he heard the voice right speaking to him the thing that does make me think it's maybe not the no god is it isn't written in the all bold caps mm. that no god's dialogue normally is written in that's the biggest thing pointing against that to me also the no god tends to sound pretty senile and this person, this entity does not sound senile. Mm. So uh, I do remember, though, this is not the first time he's he had a vision of this guy. In the first trilogy, he had a vision of this guy. Mm. He had the, the, the black figure with the legs crossed. I distinctly remember, I think it was in the Warrior Prophet, that when he had his, you know, on death's door vision, where he does, like, hear the no god at least, um, I'm pretty sure he also imagined this entity. Um, I'm curious about the imagery too, right? That like this is a shadowy figure that is seemingly sinking into the ground, right? At least that's the kind of optical illusion with the way that the stars are turning and that there's a tree behind the figure, I think, that like i don't know i don't know what to make of that fair enough do do we have specific characters associated with the tree with the tree yeah like i'm trying to think of like is there a god we know of that is associated i think of like i i don't know some sort of like nature like green 
man god or or like a fertility goddess but the closest thing is yatra to fertility right, but, it doesn't, closest, but it's not right? tree right it doesn't it doesn't feel like the tree and which itself is obviously kind of a phallic symbol so i i you know i don't know like i feel like if it was yacht where it would be all about the ground you know yeah. and the soil and things like that rather than the tree the tree i, I don't know uh, I do feel like it's something masculine coded, but I don't know beyond that. Is the no god even really a, a him, or is the no god also an it? Right? Like, are we just? I, I do think we just take it for granted, right? We haven't actually seen the no god, and, and have any sense of its sex or gender or any like. It's just like a yeah. whirlwind and a sarcophagus inside it, right? I mean, is the we sarcophagus the no god, or is the no god whatever is inside the sarcophagus? Right. If the implication inside. would be something inside it, right? But we don't know what is inside it. Is it even a dead body? You know, like wait, what the fuck? Um, I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's like a machine. You know, with the way the techne of it all. Maybe, maybe the no god is some sort of machine or some. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't think you're supposed to know who these people are right so i think it's fine we got it we got to keep our eyes out though for tree tree imagery and the mm -hmm. other thing i think of is just the uh you know with all the lord of the rings references i just think of gondor and the white tree of gondor and you know i mean i guess even going beyond that to the earlier in the first stage and the two trees yeah that Silmarils. Um, I can't remember their names, but I, I don't know how he would be inverting that as he is like to do. Um, yeah. We'll see. What do you mean? We'll see. And I think the other parts for this chapter were just like more the soldiers going crazy for the meat, I guess. Yes. A lot of meat yeah. discussions. They're like becoming strong, basically. Kind of. I mean, yeah, they're like going savage. They're yeah. le less, you know, they're like losing their compassion. They're like, yeah. I, I maybe I misread it, but I feel like they started raping the strong, even not just eating them, but like raping mm -hmm. them back, which is very strongy, you know, <laughs> like that. That that was pretty crazy. Yeah, and the descriptions of a meat make it sound so, like, disgusting nasty yeah yeah would not yeah. eat that it is not gmo <laughs> well you no know, it is but very gmo actually it's specifically genetically oh. modified by the consult that's true yeah that, that's, that's actually true. that's a fair point it is yeah. it is super genetically modified it's not just genetically modified it's created genetically only like it, it didn't exist before <laughs> yeah what and test are they test tube babies? We don't know. And then there's the whole section about the Chipalore knights going into Reola and I guess dying or becoming possessed. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, I that... could not I struggled to follow that. I I what what the fuck is going on in that city? Apparently I guess okay, the city is where it was one of the last outposts of men and they were defending from the strong. And the consul used it as like just a place for where they could take captives. I think they described it like a granary or something, right? Again, this metaphor. So they instructed the strong, put it in like their DNA or something, not to go there, just to keep the people alive so they could keep harvesting them. Hmm. Uh, and Har I think that Har harvesting, harvesting yeah. them out, like. I would think harvesting would just mean killing them, right? Yeah, but I think if you kill all of them, then you don't have any more. So I think you're just taking them oh, I see. bit by bit and letting them, I guess, reproduce so they could have more of them. It's kind of concentration camp -y, Yeah, sort of. Those are you know, straight up death camps. And I guess yeah. here they want to keep them alive. And I think the place became like a topoi, just like the other one. So it's like the barrier between bear and hell is very thin. Okay. So I think that's how, and because they stay, stay there and stuff happened, I guess, uh, they, something from hell came and took them or took part of their soul or something. Okay. Or inhabited them, yeah. 
Yeah, definitely had the haunted city vibe. Like, I, I, it was definitely creepy. I was just like struggling to understand. Like, I was like, okay, the Stronker's scared of it, but like, what's what's actually happening here? Yeah. It it reminded me of that creepy city in um, what is that Robert Jordan series called? Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time. That's what I was Wheel thinking of, time. of too. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me of the exact same thing. That like great evil was done here, and now this place itself is evil and like haunted by a, a dark spirit. Like Heron Hall, like Heron Hall. Potentially, if Heron Hall is in fact haunted, yeah, we can have a whole conversation about that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and now these guys just do whatever they want, and they eat strength, eat raw. I don't know. Why did Kelly say from now on you do whatever you want, and that's okay? Like he's almost giving them more respect, or is he getting rid of them? I think it's because he's like, I can't control them at this point. <laughs> and like, the, it, if they, it, we don't want them to turn on the rest of the army, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, maybe it's mm. better sort of... for them not to fight next to all the other normal humans. <laughs> right. They kill more strong, right? Like that is still pro their goal, you know, so. That's reasonable. Fair enough. Yeah. I I had a couple more things to talk about in the pro oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so one this was very interesting uh, when Proes asks what of love and for the first time that evening Anna Surimbor Kellis was surprised so he was surprised at the question or that even that it even came up or was he stumped for how to find an answer and later on in that uh, and this is why I thought of that intellect thing but because of because of all the passions, nothing is so alien to the god as love. Um, Kellis tells this to Proes, and then line next to that, after that, is there was a head on a pole behind him. So this entity that supposedly can't feel love and is somehow tied to the head on the pole behind him, um, that seems to correlate, but I, I still don't know what to make of it. And did, did you guys have anything to add there? Otherwise, new topic. No, I mean, it's, this... that's interesting. Yeah. I, uh... I think I understood it as like, I don't know, something along the line of he's surprised that Proyas, like he, he himself is so far away from thinking about love and Proyas is, mm. right. That's interesting. He still manages yeah. to think about like that and he's trying to, you know, hang on to that. Yeah. Instead of yeah, all the other like, stuff, so yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think of that because later when Sarva has that uh, flashback to Kellis when he comes home, and she, she's like he's grinning at her, but he's putting on the face for her, so she understands his feelings. So yeah, I, th I think they have to mimic love, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing that I wanted to bring up was what Kellis is describing as the god, this, um, there is no recompense save knowing, knowing that we know nothing, and then going on to say that a Kamian is the prophet you sought all along. This sounds very much like what the non-men say they worship. So are they the only ones who've been <laughs> worshiping the right god all along? Possibly. Yeah. It's a good observation, though, yeah. So, yeah, that's it. Those were my points for this yeah. chapter. It's also, I think, nice, like, the whole description of the prophets. It's not like the prophets from God to human, to men. It's from men trying to reach God in some way. Um, oh, yeah, that one. That, okay, yes. <laughs> to make themselves understood in any way, I guess. Yeah, the the bridge but that seems futile in the face of what he described as the god it feels almost like something like here here's a toy to play yeah. with like to distract you unless <laughs> while he i'm is off the prophet, being this right so he might be able to find some way to interact with the god so is that what those conversations are in the rest of the chapter and well okay he's not actually interacting with the god because the entity that he's talking to is telling him that my business is with the god yeah so it's not the, yeah i war not with men it says but with the god 
so it's not the god of gods that he's communicating with but yeah sure if they are in fact if in fact prophets exist that can communicate with the god um it is interesting that they communicate the men's desires to the gods and not the other way around oh it was also interesting that Kellis keeps de describing himself as the place and then later on in the Ishwal chapter uh, Mimara thinks to herself that um, that for Akamian Kellis is a place like it's a labyrinth and a maze so mm. that parallel again was interesting like Kellis thinks of Akamian as the prophet which Mimara has been calling him all along and vice versa like Mimara's the namer of things <laughs> as they are. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I, I think additionally, you know, when we think of prophets, and, and maybe maybe this, if there, if no one has anything else to say, we can kind of transition into Ishwal and uh, talking about Akami and Mimara. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about prophets, you know, we, we I think a lot of the time it, it, prophets are kind of people who share truth right and it's some sort of higher truth and you know in this series obviously there's a lot of discussion around truth and uh, you, you see it in the epigraphs a lot including in these chapters and like capital t truth right the, the big truth um just what it just what it is really um and and i do feel like you know in a lot of ways um akamian through his skepticism to truth you know, to the idea, this mortal idea of truth, um, maybe gets closer to kind of the the cosmic truths, and that in that way he does kind of play a prophet's role, right? Where he is sort of sharing ideas that are much more true than the truth, you know, in quotes uh, that you know different so-called prophets are sharing. Like, I just think I want to know what Inri Sejinus's deal is. I, I doubt we'll ever, like, find out. You know, that seems like something that's just like, oh, it's in the past. You know, it's like a mysterious for a reason. You know, it's great world building. Um, but, like, I want to know, like, did he really believe in this stuff? Was he a Kellis type? You know, was he a consult agent? Mm. What What's his deal? You know, I, 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 I don't know. I want to know about Agensis. How does he know so many things? Yeah. He, right? Um... He just seemed like a really smart dude, you know? <laughs> Yeah, how did how did he figure it all out? Was he just was he, was he just brilliant? Maybe he was the prophet. Like... Who knows? Yeah, right. People need to read more Genesis, I guess. <laughs> you know, in this world, certainly. Um, anyway, we, we we cool to move move into mm -hmm. Ishwal. Well, in that chapter, I think there's also the dream at the beginning of that chapter. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Now, Kyuti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in... so this guy... did seem to confirm that I was wrong and his wife was not a skin spy. Mm. Um, which I'm pretty sure that what came before in this book also confirmed by saying that they came later and they were created yeah, later. I, think so. So I will say that that theory of mine I think is, is shot down. Um and I guess she just sucks. <laughs> she just <laughs> yeah. on him because she wanted to not go to hell. Which like fair enough. Mm, fair okay. Enough. I mean I guess that's as good a motivation as any. Um, yeah, and I yeah. guess the, the consult is shown as being just, I don't know, they're like torsos floating in some sort of liquid or something, 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 right? I I really could not picture the imagery in, in, in this section. I tried really hard. I reread passages. I could not. The only thing I got were the withered, the 10 withered faces. Yeah. Like, I, I got I could not understand how they're connected. Like, are they all like attached on on like poles? You know, like, are they all like connected like a hydra? Mm -hmm. Like, what what, what I, I, are they like? There was something about like a a disc yeah. that they were on that was sealed. Like, I I, I could pictured not... each of them on like a disc inside this sort of like lava lamp tube around where Nekuyuti is, and it's like a vertical shaft. That's how I imagine it, but that's not oh, okay. That's not guaranteed. That's what it looked like. Okay, but that's how I imagine. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Yeah, they're like floating around in like a some sort of suspension. Um, yeah, it does feel on brand for because they're clearly dealing with like sci-fi stuff on top of just the like you know fantasy of it all. Um, like this is definitely there's some techne going on here uh, as well as magic. I feel like so. I, I 
I could see that. The lava lamp imagery. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I keep imagining things like floating behind them, sort of, you know, like a lava lamp sort of thing. Right. I don't know if it's what, true, what, but. What are your thoughts, Steve? Steve Swatha. Some of that stuff is really hard to keep up with. There's a lot that it's kind of really vague. It's hard to piece it together, kind of make sense of it sometimes. Yeah. It's creepy. Like, I, I, atmospherically, it definitely does the job, but I, I just like. I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it was cool. I mean, that guy was, it's interesting that he's like one soul inhabiting a multitude, you know, and he's this wicked, immortal yeah. human. Uh, or well, he was human, but he's now like twice damned that he's like straddling his, his thoughts, I guess, are in hell, but his yeah. body. Or his something of his soul is, is uh, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. There's a, there's a couple of discussions on like souls in these chapters, right? Like we get a lot more information on both how it works, like trapping souls, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I we definitely I feel like there's a lot we get here, and there's so much it's actually hard to like fathom it all. Uh, because we're definitely like a lot of proper nouns are thrown mm -hmm. at us a lot of, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, we definitely get a lot about the consult, like the inner workings of the consult here. And, but it's tough to like piece together everything. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't mention the, the mention of a certain item at the end of the first section there. Oh, the oh, we, we can get to that. <laughs> Absolutely. I continue to, I, I don't know where this thing is going to pop up. Or if this is just the biggest, like, debate, asshole joke in the series <laughs> that he's just, he's, he's telling us all about the Heron Spear and it's never going to come up. I, where, I, I feel like it has to, like, it, this is now, it's like, it's getting brought up again, but I fell for this the first time. I felt like that was certainly going to come up in a very, yeah. you know crusades way spear of destiny but it didn't and so now i i don't know but this is before it actually came up and killed the no god so in theory it does come up after in the timeline yeah we're but we're learning about yeah, yeah, it yeah. again right it's like a remind like narratively i feel like like this feels yeah. like it's being planted but i don't know we don't know where it is i mean that's the the the, the thing right like and for some reason, maybe my memory of this is wrong, but I felt like they got the Heron Spear from within. Uh, didn't they steal the Heron Spear yeah. from within? Well, that happened before. So I think now... Oh, right. and then he, okay. Uh, is it already in the hand of the guy that used it in the end right. or not? I don't remember. I don't know. I, I guess we don't know exactly the timeline here, yeah. maybe. Um, certainly it's not at that moment yet where it's been used. No. Uh, Never. And somehow yeah. they go hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, maybe the whole reveal is going to be that the fucking consult has destroyed it by this point. And it's like, you, you have this, th this hope built up that this one weapon can do. It and it's like, no, they got to it. They, they've got it when the Skilvindi yeah. stole it. And now it's like, fucking, it's gone. There, there is no hope. It is, has been taken from men. Possibly. I don't know. What are your thoughts on the Heron Spear of Arsha? Honestly, I feel like I care about it a lot less than you do. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just, it, like, you introduce a thing called the Heron Spear, which is a badass name. You tell us it's the only thing that can kill the No-God, which, like, okay, that's huge. And then we find out at the end of the trilogy that it's a fucking laser weapon. It's a sci-fi shit. <laughs> like, we're dealing with, like, a lightsaber. Come on. Like... No, I mean, I have become interested over the course of the series. Because of your interest, like I probably <laughs> wouldn't even have noticed it <laughs> if it if it wasn't for your bringing it up, and and I mean that in a good way. Like I I I don't tend to notice these things. So, um, the only times I've cared about the Heron Spear when you brought the, brought it up. Although this one, this time I feel like I should care about it because it's uh, what the dream was cut off mid sentence when. Right. This Mangeka school guy one is demanding where the head and spear is. So I, I guess we are leading up to 
that's not the part that Akamian focuses on at the end of the stream. But um, I do feel like we're leading up to it, playing more of a role later on. It does seem weird to me that he isn't concerned about that. Like, I guess he just doesn't care about the console at this point, that he's so single-minded in destroying Kellis that he has lost the plot, that there's also this even greater threat. But, I, I you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would think that they would want, or Kellis for that matter, like, what is his, I guess we don't know. Like, maybe he has looked for the Heron Spear. Uh, but you would think that that would be, like, first on everyone's mind of, like, we, we need to find this thing in case the no god comes back i you know i don't know i mean knowing Kellis, i feel like he had to have done something about it he must have at least tried but i i don't know well i guess we just we just don't know we don't know what went on there yeah and I don't even know at this point if Kellis wants to kill the no god like what what is he trying to do if if he is trying to destroy the no god before well first i guess he wants to stop that stop him from even being awakened but if he is awakened i guess he needs a weapon to kill him but i'm not sure that he does want to kill the no god which i guess would make sense that you know at least now with some Kellis POV and those weird conversations, he's complaining that men tend to die and whatever's talking to him is saying, no, but you need to burn the field. So he's resisting the idea of destroying all the men. So maybe he doesn't want the no-god to come back, but maybe he will be on the side that wants to awaken the no-god because of whatever this thing is telling him to do. Yeah, he finally gives in. I don't mm. know. It's... Yeah, he he is hard to predict, right? We to know the inner workings of Kellis. Yeah, I was glad that Ishwal wasn't a complete dead mm. end. I'll say if we were ready to move on to mm -hmm. Ishwal proper, um, I mean I was convinced it was like that. That would have just been so fucking lame if they walked all this way and there was absolutely nothing in Ishwal. Um, and what we got was suitably messed up. But also interesting. I mean, shit. Kellis has another kid. That's crazy. Learning about the whale mothers. That was horrible. That whole scene was phenomenal. I got to give it to Baker. That that was some top tier writing. Um, just really powerful stuff. The whale mothers. I think it's one of the most fucked up things yeah. in this series. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. Does does that mean that there are no female Dunian? No, Vols have a female Dunian. Yeah. No, as in like. The ones who are called uh, Dunian, who, I don't think who like are the filtered intellect. Not. Seems like not... I mean, I, I think it's tied to what Mimara sees, that like, at least in the judging eye, that women have the lesser soul. And so the Dunian, for some reason, are like... They somehow figure that out, even though I don't know if they believe in souls, I... and they make them whale mother. I mean, it's clearly a sexist thing, right? Like, this is not, not good. Um... But maybe that's like tied to it, or they want. I, don't I think know. it's actually the opposite because Vimara sees from like what the God of Gods sees, right? And even she says, yes, but this is not what women are supposed to be. And like the instead, the Dunyane come to this conclusion from a purely biological, sort of, I guess, rational point of view. Like for them, it's just like, what's the most efficient way of reproducing and without, you know, if, if, it, if their role is to just to reproduce, then they have no need to do anything else, right? That's, that's right. I mean, that's... purely utilitarian, right? So that's like the abomination of it, just being purely practical, I guess. It's not even practical though. Like there's so much more, it, it, it's such a, like it's boiling down a whole like a multitude into a single well if you role. if you want to do i guess highly accelerated genetic uh, modifications without our technology then the only way you can do it is by having a ton of i guess reproduction so there's probably a lot of 
beats Wilma first. And again, it was showing them like in a row, just going at it. And it was just trying to have the, probably the most amount of babies and they're just killing all the ones that were not what they needed because they needed just like extremely fast, high amount of permutations, I guess. Yeah, it's true. You got to pump out a lot of kids. Yeah. It's like so inhumane, I guess. That's just from a different yeah. perspective, I guess. Not. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I read it. I actually think it's really, it's, it's really cool and normal. It reminds me a lot. More sound bites. <laughs> of, I don't know if anyone has seen Bone Tomahawk. No. Yeah. The scene, it reminded me of that. Yeah. Thing. The scene with the. Yeah. Which is also extremely fucked up. Yes, it is. And it's. Well, it's just. Yeah. yeah it's just sad. At least they're it's dead horrible. here, at least. At least there's not anymore. Hopefully. They're yeah. dead now. Yeah. yeah. But they're probably in hell. I guess <laughs> if there's no way why why would they be like the um the damnation logic of this world makes no sense to me they are the lesser soul sure and they did what they are supposed to and they still go to hell well they didn't do anything to ingratiate themselves to any god did they which seems to be the way i don't know yacht were i mean i guess they didn't maybe worship yacht i, I guess the problem is just they're doing mm -hmm. you know like they are doing they're just this is what women the female dunyan are you know they're the whale mothers which is just bleak yeah it's well you would think yachtwer would have their back but i guess yachtwer is a phony <laughs> they're all phonies yeah. i'm becoming holden caulfield about these gods <laughs> i mean they do something they do things they, they they do things, but not even not even consistently. Like Kenny, what did it what did the uh, the Ishroy call um, yacht were the fertility principle? Yeah. Come on, it doesn't get apparently a bigger fertility principle than these fucking whale mothers who aren't allowed to do anything else. They're literally basically they're sla they're like they're like yacht were distilled. They're the victims. They're, they're the slaves. They're women. They give but birth. For yacht were, the it's like the giving. It's like you need, you need, it's not taking from you, right? Well, both. Yeah, but I think there needs to be some level, at least from Yatra's perspective, of you voluntarily accepting that thing to happen, I guess. So does she not represent women who are raped? I guess I just assume, I don't know if it's ever I don't said think that. So. I know that talk about it like because like um, you see how satma like the like how she approaches things like yeah i guess you could define it as her getting raped in some of these circumstances but it's her like she's in not in control but she's i don't know there's some level of participation from her of active right. participation in the giving i guess i mean yeah that's what she spells out is she she learned the power of of giving and yeah but again the gods are i don't know who knows how, what they think very convoluted <laughs> yeah it's fucked up yeah in a what lot are... of ways isn't what the dunian do exactly like what the consul do with the shrank yes yeah mm -hmm. absolutely i had the same thought it's like the same shit just just yeah. to different ends and less efficient probably mm. and less efficient yeah. probably that's true the dunian really are like the consult in miniature which is kind of what they think right like mimara and which i will say is super satisfying to have mimara finally turn on kellis and realize kellis sucks yeah. um and yeah i came in you know they're just evil right mimara calls it out it's like there's just no other word for it it's beyond any excuse yeah so how do you feel they're gonna then interact with these two new duny we got i don't trust them as far <laughs> as i can throw them we got another evil kid hmm. wait does that make serva and the Lyoba the only female like enlightened dunyan 
Seems like it. Yeah, it does seem like that. Interesting. What did everyone think about the the details around how the survivor and the boy made like the battle, I guess, that happened? Definitely sounds epic and chaotic. And a lot went on in the 30 years between the series. Um, and I guess the consult found them, or at least the Strongs did. Has it mentioned how they found them? I can't remember. No. no. I don't think so. Do you think I, someone I hope... told them? Kellis told them? Yeah, I was going to say, I almost think Kellis set, set the Shrank on them. So that, that would they be wouldn't crazy. be that... found. They never do that. Sure. <laughs> I have a bridge I want to sell you, Dad. Well, I'm sure he loves his children that he has there very much. It it is wild. Like that's something I hadn't even considered that Kellis had another kid. Like it, that that's one of those like reveals that just makes perfect sense in hindsight. You're like, yeah, he left. He was like a fully grown man. He was like thirty something, you know. And with how the Dunian work, of course, he's like popped out a kid at least one. Yeah, he might have even more. Right. I think it's it, it's interesting too the the so the the the, the actual child here, um, who I I feel like we don't get a name for. Do we get a name? Um, he's like the last born Dunian, right? Which was interesting because we met apparently the last born non man. Um. And I don't know if there are any intentional parallels there or like what that would mean, but that's just something I, I occurred to me um, in the span of a few chapters. We got the last of two different species, you know. Uh, I don't know what that means other than maybe, <laughs> maybe we're reaching the end times. Do we actually believe that the rest of the Dunian are gone? That's what they say. Yeah, that's that's a fair question. Again, would they lie? Where would they? Yeah, where would they be? I mean, deeper inside the mountains. Do you think any of them, none of them, would have escaped the shrank, gone out the other side? <laughs> somewhere in the I, labyrinth. I feel like. I'm sorry, Steve. What were you saying? Oh, just maybe they're somewhere in the labyrinth. Yeah. I guess they could still be hiding, right? I guess this could all be a, a, a game. Um, maybe they, they went over to the consult. I don't know. I feel like the kid, they, I don't know. Yeah, I guess they would have to be hiding in the uh, thousand, thousand halls. Isn't, isn't it somewhat strange that they were sort of at the borders of the labyrinth if all the people had run for their lives deep into the mountains? Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what are they doing, right? Like the battle is over. Like, are we just gonna chill there forever? Mm -hmm. Where it's clearly unsafe. <laughs> uh, there are shrank that are still coming there. I yeah, I simply do not believe Kellis left the Dunyane untouched and all the time. So I I would be shocked if he had not gone back or at least yeah didn't unleash this shrank on them or something. I, you know I. It would just seem so strange to me if he decided, oh, I'm just going to leave them be. Like, his calculus is that they, they don't matter. You know, they can, whatever can happen to them. So he could have either set the shrank on them, which is the, but why, why would he do that? Um, the other reason, the other thing he could have done is warned them that they are about to be found because this Akamian guy is coming there. And sent them way deep into the mountain and then made it look like the Shrank have attacked. Interesting. Well, the, yeah. They, they talk about the, the Shriekers and the Singers, and the Singers were non men. Hmm. That's right. Erratics. So we turned on the con tuned to the consults in the um, pursuit of murder and memory. So we know we know earlier, I think it was in Twilight like Warrior, that Kellis was friendly with some non men. So maybe it's part of a deal, or maybe he's 
to making friends and influencing non-men. <laughs> it, it is interesting too that this last, like the boy is, Mimara describes uh, him as a boy with his head shaved in mockery of Nogikas. Mm-hmm. Like, is that just acknowledging because that's like the one non-man she's met? Or is it... Maybe. You know, is there something more specific there that she's seeing? Odd. <laughs> what? I have a ridiculous theory, which is like, I'm just having Please. fun. <laughs> yeah. Kellis extracted his son, who is very close to the absolute, and then handed him off to some non <laughs> And so now they've shaped their heads to look like non men. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Diplomacy at work. I mean, that wouldn't be a terrible diplomatic plan, you know. Hostage exchange is is a mm. is a classic, as we've seen, a classic sort of thing. But um... oh, he had a different interaction with the non men for which he had to fulfill the neom. <laughs> oh, like a different group of non men. Mm-hmm. I think this was the last house. Or maybe with like a smaller group, but it's the last mansion, I guess. Fish Terbian. But maybe mm-hmm. there's smaller groups somewhere. It's unclear. But anyway, I wasn't doing that one seriously. But as I said, <laughs> Niam out loud, that that sounds a lot like the Hindi word Niam, <laughs> which means law or, uh, yeah, I guess principle. Interesting. Hmm. I mean, it made sense because it's kind of like, it's like a pact. A, I don't know. Yeah, like a law or something. Because mm. they seem very, like, oh, we have to follow it if they fulfill it, right? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that part had a very, you know, ancient, ancient Greek or ancient, I don't know, Roma or something sort of feeling to it, right? Yeah. Everything with the non men definitely. I, I, for a while, they were giving me like Egyptian vibes, but it, I definitely felt very Roman influence when I, or, or, yeah, or Greek. I mean, it just felt very like, it almost felt like we were in the forum, mm-hmm. or, or not the forum. But, uh, yeah, no, the forum, I think. I guess it could be the yeah. forum. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, watching the Senate convene, and it's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Any other thoughts on Ishwal? Oh, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in Ishwal, I guess. Is there? Uh, oh, no, not Ishwal, sorry. I was thinking, yeah, no, go ahead. I was not thinking of Ishwal. Ishterban. They're very similar names. Yes, they are. I'm down mm-hmm. to jump to, I mean, that's our last chapter, yeah, but yeah. if we want to skip through it, that's fine with me. Nah, it's, we should go in order. Yeah. On to Momin. Mm-hmm. Yes. That was, uh, so I, I, what do you make, Varsha, of, um, I guess I'm, I'm skipping the, the little shit of <laughs> Um, what, what do you make of him being told slash believing, thinking that a jokely is, the Narendar, which equals White Luck Warrior. Like, I feel like he's just wrong, right? Like, we've had no reason to think a joke being the White Luck Warrior are the same entity, right? Yeah. Uh, as far as I understand, the White Luck Warrior replaced, like, took the spot of one of a joke Lee's Narendari. Hmm. Yeah, I... I don't think the White Luck Warrior and the... Uh... And the Narinda are the same person. Like, as in, he, he may have moved on. I, I agree with you. I, I don't think that he his continued persistence there is as the White Luck Warrior. Um, I did... This was interesting. Like, in Momen, Narinda is synonymous with uh, Ajokri's assassins. Whereas uh, the Zoom guy, Soranga, tells so real that he is not in there because he's a god's assassin so is that just difference in terminology or is um is soranga wrong 
and Narendar means specifically a Jokli's assassin. And we haven't been told yet that the White Luck Warrior has something to do with a Jokli. I it it feels like a weird thing to withhold, you know, at yeah. this point. Yeah. And they don't feel like they have a lot in common in terms of like the kind of imagery and symbolism we've got. Like the White Luck Warrior is very serious. It's a warrior, you know, yeah. so therefore like, you know, associated with war, while a Jokely is a trickster. Mm-hmm. Is a murderer you know and certainly while warriors commit a lot of murder it's supposed to be more of a like and i guess he's an assassin the white luck warrior so he is committing murder so i guess that is very a joke we ask um i i i don't know i just didn't i definitely didn't have any reason to it like if anything i was i think i brought up before like is is the white luck warrior gil gale because that's the only other god that like to me makes any thematic connection you know it makes sense but i don't know we, we were told that the white luck warrior is yadvar's yeah. brother who yeah. is the god of war right but we weren't told specifically which god yeah he's just he's a god of war he definitely was called okay that yeah could a trickster god be a god of war like the chaos they feed off of the chaos and oh who had this thought i forget that god gods are um they don't need like individual they don't follow individual lives it's like the larger human events that feed them so things like wars and uh famine and plagues and so on i forget where that came up was it kelmomus thinking that no that sounds too mature for him was it memara i don't know that's too mature for him he definitely has some very adult thoughts hmm. kelmomus that's true. There's always this like impish, childish aspect to him, but he, I, I definitely felt like at, at times when I was reading his section, I was like, he feels like he is thinking like an adult here, mm -hmm. um, like a very, you know, petulant adult, but um, nonetheless. Oh, I, I don't mean mature, like grown up, more like sensible, <laughs> mature, but I. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. He's definitely crazy. Yeah. No doubt about that. Um. But, but yeah, what, where was I going with that? Yeah, a jokely, if, as a trickster, if he feeds on chaos, and these are the events that bring about chaos, then it could make sense that he is also a god of war. Um, if we don't know yeah. yet who the god of war is, that the white luck warrior is supposed to represent. It definitely is possible, yeah. I, I It just feels like a... It, to me, if if they are ultimately one and the same, or or like intimately connected in that way, it would feel to me like a kind of crude thing because I just feel like there there just hasn't been that sort of connection before. Um, but I I don't know. Yeah, but isn't I it? I just feel like he's wrong. Like I, I, I feel like this is one of those cases of like unreliable narrator. You know, like he, he, he's just incorrect and he's making a leap. Like he's still convinced the, the voice in his head is his little brother, and I just simply do not believe that. Like I, <laughs> if the series ends and we still haven't found out who it is, I will still not believe it. I do not <laughs> believe that is Sammy. Okay. Okay. Mm. <laughs> isn't isn't it interesting though that. The prologue of this second series started with that Ajokli Kelmomus interaction. And also, like, we seem to be setting up to give Ajokli a much bigger role now. Yeah. So, I mean, it isn't technically out of nowhere, but I agree with you that it is a little bit out of the left field. So, well, I, I don't think it's out of nowhere for like Ajokli to play a role, or let alone to play a role in Kelmomus' storyline. It just feels like the White Luck Warrior and Ajokli have not had any sort of connected yeah. tissue in the same way White Luck Warrior and Yacht were have, mm. you know? Or, I mean, I guess the one time was when the White Luck Warrior killed a, a Narendar who was a Narendar of Ajokli. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. It just, it, it just like, I, I, I feel like if they were like one in the same or like intimately tied together, we would have heard about that by now. And this is the first time that's really actually happened. You know what I mean? Like they just don't have that relationship. So they, I just, it just feels wrong to me because of that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Like no arguments there. Yeah. There's a good <laughs> detail here for people, you know, for me and Steve, where I was like, I guess if I was a genius the first time I read it, I would have been able to notice it, but <laughs> now it's very obvious. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's, it's specifically mentioned, but like you don't notice it. There's so much mentioned, there's so much going on and it's hard to know who to, what's reliable and what's not. Yeah. That's so. definitely true, right? What what is accurate information and what is yeah, you know, just point of view perspective. And which statements are like, oh, this is not just this, it's like it means a lot more. Right. right. And which is and which ones are just oh it's a description. I, I do feel like that there is some truth to the idea that Kelmomus did make some offering to mm. Ajokli, you know, by torturing the bug in front of the statue. Like even even without meaning to, I, I, I do believe that, that that adds up, like that there was some sort of divine connection there. I just don't feel like, like he's interpreting that as he fired the White Luck Warrior into their court, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, using the White Luck Warrior as this like slow moving bullet metaphor, right? When everything we understand is the White Luck Warrior is aimed at Kellis, and this is just on the path, you know? This is this is the the path that Yacht were laid out for him, uh, and we're and we're even that comes up again in in uh, Ishtarabend. We actually have a a better understanding now of how Sorwheel relates to White Luck Warrior. It's not one hundred percent clear, but Sorwheel is the anointed. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're described as like two sort of champions of Yacht were or something. The I, I forget the the word used to describe the White Luck Warrior. It's like the the not like the summoned. It was like some yeah. something like, like fill, there, there was some. Uh, I I don't remember, but the, I do remember anointed was the term used to describe sword yeah. wheel. So the, there is a difference between them at this point. Um, which, yeah, I I don't fully know what to make of it, but that, that I think does clarify some level of like. They're maybe tied into a larger plan, but they're not necessarily the same figure. It then opens the door of like which one of them actually kills Kellis, if either of them does. Both at the same time. <laughs> both of the, yeah, maybe. It's just y'all were ma ma making sure they don't. Uh, maybe miss. they need to both interact with each other. I don't know. One needs to lift the other one or something. Exactly. <laughs> He's a little too short. He can't quite reach Kellis on his like dais, you know. So, just hoist him up on his back. Um, Maybe. I guess we don't know. Yeah. What's going on? I still don't know how the fuck the White Luck Warrior gets all the way up there. Like they walked a really long way. Um, yeah. I I don't know how all that's gonna work. Where he's not making any progress. He's staying in the court so i don't know I, I don't know what's going on there i know <laughs> yes you do <laughs> what what was the offering that kelmomus supposedly made to a joke i'm sorry not the offering the prayer that he had like did he make some requests of him not of him but like did he have some thoughts in his mind about his family and wanting them all to die <laughs> that may have <laughs> well he thinks that a lot so yeah. you know may, maybe a, a jokely just like read between the lines there <laughs> it's like hey, you got it kid I mean, yeah. good good beaters <laughs> here yeah. here let me send you a white luck warrior <laughs> 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 yeah thanks for torturing this bug mm -hmm. i got you <laughs> he's thinking about how to kill fill the open now right yeah yes which, which no surprise yeah like that, that was the most obvious thing. <laughs> I feel bad for her, though. She seems like she's like sort of not, sort of nice, yeah. I guess. I'm, I'm a Theliopa yeah. fan. I mean, she did counsel her mother to kill the prostitute, I guess, but. Uh... 
Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. She also sucks, but I- I'm a fan. I'm on Team Theliopa. Uh, better than Tom Wilmoth, for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's our benchmark. Yeah. What do you think of her decision <laughs> not to tell Esmenet about Tom Wilmoth? I hate it. I hate mm. it. I understand the logic, but I, I hate it. It drives me nuts, and it's going to backfire. It's. I would. I would be... It would be more shocking to me if she doesn't end up dead by Kel mm. head hands mm. through this. Like, it feels like she just basically signed her own death warrant by not doing anything about it. Like, these people are not taking this kid seriously enough. It's infuriating. Yeah. It's got a very similar vibe to the first series, and now you're knowing about Kellos and not telling anyone, and we're like, oh, just, just, tell, right. just tell them. <laughs> someone yeah and of course as soon as he does it makes a huge difference right he finally tells Akamian and that completely changes the tide and you know ultimately Akamian is and it's just too late at that yeah. point like they, they just can't stop him if ever they could yeah. fucking these these fucking yeah. people with their secrets and what about the Kamoma screaming the Narendra kills him I hope so. <laughs> That's my thought. Okay. I, I don't know. Did he also, am I wrong? He also dreamed of the the Narendar sleeping with his mother? Really? The Miss Fairness. I thought there was something about that, but maybe it was like at the end mm-hmm. it happened. Maybe a Miss Fairness. What was I going to say? Uh, yeah, as as he's thinking about the White Luck Warrior slash a joke, Lee slash mm-hmm. Narendar, uh, killing his mom ultimately, um, we we have in that same scene he hid in the deepest marrow where he wept and wailed for the imagery that shrieks beneath his soul's eye. The tour glimpses of mother penetrated, violated time and again, her beauty battered from her face, her skin perforated, bleeding like gills. Maps of blood cast across her. Precious urban frescoes. Well, I assume that was like but being stabbed. I, that maybe with a knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that maybe with a knife. It, it occurs to me that is, you know, I yeah. Mean, <laughs> Baker knows what he's doing, right? Like, and there, there is weird Freudian shit going on with Kilmumis's obsession with his mom. Like, there, there, it's weird. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if if he hits puberty, I would not be surprised if he starts having sexual feelings about his mother. So. <laughs> I, it's the the kid is is he's got issues. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I feel like he's this close to that. Yeah, he really. I agree. I'm like he's like right on the edge. <laughs> to take like one little hormonal rush. Yeah. And ugh. Yeah. I thought it was also interesting that how he realizes that all the things that happened, even though he was moving them, like he was not in control of anything. Mm. Yeah. That's when he has the Ajokuri realization, right? It's chaos, baby. <laughs> it feels like very ordered chaos, though. Like, if it's all pre-planned, like he thinks it is. Yeah. It feel, feels very Ajokuri. Like, set off, set off a, you know, possess this little kid, set him off, and watch what unfolds. Hmm. That's that's still my number one theory. We'll, we'll see. It may not be true, but... I mean, a joke is somewhere, right? Like, he's not going to... I don't know. Actually, the Heron Sphere still hasn't come up, so maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. Maybe <laughs> Jokely is, is this series is, you know, the, this quartet's Heron Sphere, and we're, it's just going to be, you know, I'm going to have blue balls at the end of it. Yeah. I keep I keep going back to that moment in The White Lug Warrior when uh, Esmanet is outside the palace and, like, everyone comes to attack the Andiamin Heights. Mm-hmm. Kelmomus thinks to himself that he need not worry for his mother because Ajokri's doing this and so that means that his mother will be fine. Like, how did he even know that? Like, it, I didn't get this based on his full internal monologue through this chapter. I didn't get the sense that he feels like he has this excellent working relationship with this god. It's like he's just... No. It, 
it's like he's just realizing that the god may be interfering so given that what do we make of that previous thought he had that ajokri is handling this everything's fine when did he have that thought when um when esmenet is caught outside and the palace was being attacked by mathenet's people he's worried briefly for esmenet and then he's like yeah no i i i think she'll be fine because this four horned brother is handling this maybe he like didn't really believe it you know <laughs> like maybe it was like oh yeah like things are fine like it's it's chaos and it'll be you know it'll be a, i i don't know i i don't remember that part so i, I don't remember he definitely mm. doesn't feel like he has a, a a controlled relationship, understandably, with a jokely. Yeah, and and that's the moment in which I thought that maybe you were right, Carl, about the voice in his head being maybe a jokely. And then we go back to him addressing the voice as Sammy. <laughs> and I, okay, back to square one in both places. <laughs> I just, I just, like, part of the reason I don't believe it's Sammy is I'm like, okay, what's the payoff? Like, what, what, what is Baker trying to say mm. here? Like, what, what, what is actually happening here? You know, as opposed to like, with the way you know thematically, this series, this this final quartet, uh, seems to really be about, in a big way, if not wholly, about the gods you know, playing chess with mortals and that mortals can't really help. And we see this really highlighted in Sorwheel's chapter where he quite literally is not acting of his own volition. And that to me feels like it it, it ties perfectly in, you know, if, if a Jokely or someone is speaking to Kelmomus, if not outright possessing him. And of course he wouldn't know because he's a stupid little child. Yeah. I mean, super intelligent, but... He is still yeah. a kid, and a psycho kid at that. I, there's something In the there. Same way, there's something I, there with the voice. Right. I, yeah. Right. Exactly. I. I. You know, I. I feel like we comfortably say that Kelmomis is in some way delusional, right? Like he's not like totally, completely rational, you know, and. I maintain in the same way that Kellis, despite everything he says, is not completely, like he's still something is motivating him that is not innately rational. And I just think Kelmomis is a more exaggerated version of that in the way that all his kids in some way are like exaggerated aspects of Kellis. Do you think that the voice in Kellis' head is all that is irrational about him? Or do you think there's more than that? No, I think it goes deeper than that. I mean, I think before, unless it's been there this entire time. I, I mean, I guess that's the big question is like, with the gods, you don't know. I, assuming it's one of the gods, I, I I, don't know. I just think that he's not completely cut off in the darkness that comes before is is, is my opinion. Yeah. Because again, I, I mean, I said this way back in the first trilogy that like, he would not be motivated if he genuinely had like no desire. Like the, even the desire for the absolute is, is a desire. Mm -hmm. Like where does that come from? You know, the, the, it's, it is a inherently paradoxical philosophy and one that is in my mind, it's circular logic. Um, it, it just feeds itself. It's not, you know, I, I, I do think he's more strictly logical than your average human, but not, I mean, he hasn't reached the absolute. He says define, it which himself is in these chapters. He says, despite everything I've still done, he still feels like the darkness. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I do think Kellis finally kind of acknowledges that, um, which is interesting that he seems to be aware of that. So tough to tell with him. Tough to tell everything. It's like, it's insane how like, <laughs> you've read so much of this series and you're still every single thing. You're like, what's going on? But you're like a lot of things are happening. A lot of things make sense, but still, you're like, it's it's just all smokes and mirrors. What's uh, what's really happening? Right. How about with Fanayal and yeah, uh, Mim Goey and yeah. Well, Zedim? I guess yeah. Now he's Fanayal. I guess now Yatwer is 
taken control of the Phantom, I guess, at this point. It seems like it's all a yeah. plan. It's all going to lead to something from Yatwa, right? That was an awesome scene when, like, full horror movie, he just gets, like, suspended in the air. That was very cool. Yatwa is, is not fucking around. Yeah, I mean, she she is supposed to be, like, I think maybe the most powerful, like, the equal to Gilgal of the gods, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, on that, that whole subplot, Varsha? Yeah, I think Nana Ferry has been pretty fascinating. I can't say I enjoy the fascination with period blood. I did not like that scene at all. But yeah. uh, by the rest of it, I think how she's described almost like this languishing cat like with not a care in the world like she knows that she's in control of the whole situation um yeah i think that's really interesting it feels like at this moment yatwar is the one driving everything which makes you wonder what her relationship is with the god of gods um and we talked about this a little bit last time given what kellis has told us about the god of gods what does that mean the hundred are like what are they even um i guess some possibilities we discussed uh catching dan up were like maybe ascended humans or some de demons demons yeah. that got away and became gods or whatever but but like regardless what she seems to be for some for whatever reason driving all the events right now and given what we know in the next chapter where the non-men they have this realization that Kellis didn't send Sorville because he was aware of Sorville's involvement with Yathwar, but more that they are now involved in whatever Yathwar is apparently plotting. And even though Yathwar apparently cares about them as much as they care about the Emma, mm -hmm. they are now suddenly feeling respect for her and like, yeah, we can't we can't do anything to make her angry at us, which again I think adds these additional layers to her importance, and that's where it all started too. Like the Ajokli and the Yathwar scenes were where the series started way back in the Judging Eye. So yeah, it absolutely. makes sense that these are the two gods that seem to be now driving a lot of things. Um. But yeah, I'm very curious to see where it's going. I, I don't have any answers, just a lot of like, oh, where is this going? If we're moving on to Ishtar event, I, I, I'm curious what everyone's thoughts are on what Sirwa is doing to the non-men. Because I am like, she literally just like singing songs about their past to them and that's arresting their emotions. Like, I, Like, is this some like, Cersei, like the goddess, not like Cersei Lannister, like it, it, it is. I I I'm confused about exactly what's going Some on. Some manipulation there. going on, it seems. Right. That that that, that was as far as yeah. I got. <laughs> I think she, yeah, I think she is singing songs to them. I don't know what purpose. Like, is she trying to make them fall in love? Even though we know what happens with non-men. Right. Fall in love. Um, yeah. But she seems unperturbed by their torture, I guess. Right. She she's okay, and Moingus is not suffering. not okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just a normal guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he he really is. He's just he's just he's just dealing with the shit. Yeah, but I guess we do get confirmation of like, well, sort of covers confirmation that like they were trying to make him hate them so they could fulfill the neon i guess right but it yeah it just i guess who knows what kellos has thought i guess kellos thought they would be able to that was his plan hmm And we got added uh, depth to the magic, you mm -hmm. know, 
the mask. Yeah. That it's some sort of spiritual, I mean, it's yeah. possession, right? It's got the soul it, of it's... the amulet. It's got the soul of the non man which is interesting because, again, we got other possessions, sort of other things before. And I think this is something I can mention because we, we have all the information. It's a theory. I don't know if it's real. But okay. I read some people theorizing that uh, the reason uh, Akamian can see now Coyote is something to do like his soul was put into the heart of Siswata in a similar like soul, you know, capturing thing. Oh, uh, interesting. Interesting. And maybe even Siswata's like soul was being captured into the like his heart, so that and that's how they're trying, you know, transferring that knowledge. That's cool. So the theory that I had this time now Coyote is the one who was rumored to be Seswata's yeah. son, right? So I thought maybe it's a genetic thing <laughs> that, that ha you have access to now Coyote's memories now because of whatever in the heart magic gives them access to Seswata's yeah. but... <laughs> it's a theory it's a theory <laughs> yeah, I went I went the gen genetic route genetic memory <laughs> Not that there's... <laughs> yeah I mean, but that does that still doesn't explain a lot of the other things he saw in which neither of them were present. Is there anything where neither of them is present? I'm trying to think. I think so. I think there was there scenes... are at least memories uh... that Seswata is missing from that do not involve now mm. Kayudi. And maybe they're supposed to be like Seswata was originally in the memories and is no longer it was unclear to me if they were like Seswata memories that suddenly Seswata wasn't a part mm. of or if they are completely disconnected mm. and they just take place in the same age. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess th this idea of possession, it does open the idea that maybe Sammy's soul or, or some other dead person's soul is in Kelmomus. It just feels so, it just doesn't feel right. Anyway, I, I don't want to get sidetracked with that again. Um, I do think it's interesting that it's this, like, you know, crazy, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A sadist, yeah. non-man, seemingly, that, that has inhabited Sorwheel. Uh, definitely bo does not bode yeah. well. Like, that's not a not not the type of soul you would want possessing. Yeah. I mean, is that the kind of soul you uh, would want to give to someone as your interpreter, as your, like, conduit to your civilization? <laughs> yeah, really, he was not, he was, like, explicitly not popular. Yeah. Like, I, I have all the people to stick in, and you would think it would be, like, I don't know, Sinjara Sunmoy or yeah. someone, like, throw, throw some I mean, it is a punishment for and... putting the soul of someone in there, right? So, yeah, I, I, for one of them, you know, like that's, that's, that's tough. Um, but did you get the impression that any of the non-men really liked each other? Like, they still I think cared? That's fair. They, they're definitely not all fond of each other. They respect some more than others, though. That's like, true. they definitely, like, there's, yeah. there's a level of, like, almost worship, you know. Hmm. The, it, again, it feels kind of very Roman uh, to me. I, I... So kind of out to talking about them more, I, I do not trust the last born as far as I can throw. I mean, maybe Baker's just made me, he has made me, uh, I just don't trust people anymore in this series. Um, this, this non-men guy who's seemingly super, super friendly, friendly yeah. you know, yeah. who's, who's just the new Kuya for Sorewheel. No, this dude has some scheme going on and Sorewheel is going along with it. And, uh, it's, not going to be pleasant. But he's only doing what Yatar wants him to do. So. Does he fine. even have a choice <laughs> in anything? I don't know. Well, that really, no. doesn't That's seem something like I was it. wondering with like the non-men. So like if the non-men see, okay, he's a vessel of Yatar, so we should leave him to do what he needs to do. But in theory, since Yatar can see anything, if the non-men decided to do something to him, wouldn't that would Yatar be what Yatwer wanted to happen. 
Yes. So yes. here you can do anything anyways, and that's because you did it, it's but what I think, it's supposed to happen? Well, I think the point is it's not, though. There's only one path that's going to be taken, you know? And so nothing yeah. is going to happen. But the logic is kind of circular, that's how I'm saying. <laughs> oh, yes, but, it is absolutely circular. It's, it's a paradox. But that's how they are rationalizing what y Yatwar's I'm saying, I'm talking about this like I know what I'm saying, but, uh, <laughs> but um, so Yat was directing them to think that and rationalize that way so that they leave Sorville alone. <laughs> that was it's true. Maybe it's just their perspective, right? Like maybe it's not even just what Yat were like, maybe she isn't in complete control maybe. and it's, they're just like, all hail yacht work you know like i guess we'll, we're we're not gonna fuck yeah. with her you know yeah. so this is what she wants you know yeah, but, they're the ones with the circular logic it's very know. much to be of the same opinion as the oh what's the other civilization me right we like the least you have interaction with the gods the better it is like if you catch their attention yeah. it's bad i would agree with that you know that seems reasonable to me is that just a thing from mythology? Because Malazan has a lot of that too. Like, don't catch the gods' attention. Is that just a thing people said Very in the past? Greek like... and Roman approach. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. Mesopotamian too, I guess. That sort of period. It's like, yeah. Well, it, it, it reminds me, like, kind of of that, like, classic Chinese proverb of, like, you know, uh, you don't want to live in, like, interesting mm. times or, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm saying it incorrectly, but, right? Like, if if the most important beings in existence are paying attention to you, that probably means your life is gonna suck. That's you know, true. like like that's not it's not like you're gonna you know they don't just act to the people who are like casually like farming. You know, <laughs> they're concerned with like the players, mm. and if you're a player, you know that's usually not a a, a pleasant existence. Very different than it reminds me, you know, Lord of the Rings discussion Pippin with Ga Gandalf. Or some or Frodo Dorma. I think it was Pip. No, maybe it was Frodo. Something like uh, I wish I was born in a different time where it didn't have to do this. And he's like, "Well, you just have to do the best you can in difficult times." And yeah. No, in this case, no. sorry, <laughs> sorry, he just has to do the best he can. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh God, there was speaking of rationalization. I do not remember where this quote is was it in what in the moment chapter but or was it memara there's something about oh yeah i think when she's thinking to herself about akamian she says something interesting about how people rationalize to themselves and mm. i can't find it now but i think it was on the right side of the page let me see if I... <laughs> I don't remember, but it was a very interesting quote. I can imagine. It seems very appropriate for the book. Yes. In interjecting while, while you're finding that. I, I got to give credit to Baker. While we were in Serwa's head, I simultaneously felt bad for her <laughs> because uh, I, it really clicked just how terrible her parents are and also hated her more because of how just how how terrible her worldview is you know and, and you know how much she i mean it's a classic she just like looks down on everyone it's all manipulative i mean it's the classic kind of dunian shit but definitely also more yeah explicitly you know emotional in a sense but, i mean she was like before she was trying to relate to her about her right until right. then she got disillusioned yes Kind of like, yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's definitely the tragedy. And it is not surprising that Esmanet was a bad mother, but you know, that yeah. it, it is still sad. Yeah. Part two. Also, something I was wondering is, the, is one of the guys with uh, uh, Neil Ch Chiljiras or something, yeah. whatever. The guy with the yeah. necklace of human skulls. Is that the guy from the first book with the, you know? I was wondering that too. Because that's, well, that's the second time now we've had a human scout yeah. non-man decorated. Suspicious. But the other guy had a cloak. Yeah. Or maybe you know? he keeps his cloak outside. 
<laughs> right. He, he's like, that's not that's not formal enough, you know, for this, or it's it's too warm for that. Uh, I mean, they're both associated with a call so It seems so. Maybe. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh, so unless you were trying to lead us down a false path and you're a false prophet, I'm getting the sense that we never have it confirmed who oh, that non man is. I, that's that's very possible. Okay. I okay. Hey, there's <laughs> so enough. many little details and things in these books that right. it's very like I I forget the main plot points because we don't get his name right in the prologue. No. He like doesn't name himself. He's just like the non man in Callus's point of view yeah yeah i mean yeah it's kind of fucked up how it's just where a necklace of human skulls why yeah and all the other non-men are kind of like yeah that's fine they got established yeah. their i guess they, i mean they face fucked up the mama so they don't think they treat them very well for sure so <laughs> maybe it's pretty normal yeah, I guess even the most enlightened of non-men, I don't think, cares too much for probably lesser beings. I, I think it's possible some of them did, though. Like, once upon a time, like, I think they maybe did love at some humans, and that's part of the tragedy, you know? Maybe they still look down on them as, like, a lesser being, but I, I feel like, like, we're, the way we hear about, like, Nil Gikas yeah. and his relationship with Seswatha and just in general, like that we're told all these signs that like these non mens had these like loved humans and even had like sexual romantic relationship with humans that then led to tragedy inevitably. Kind of in the classic Lord of the Rings yeah. elven human pairing way, but like in a fucked up way. Yeah. You know? As as is tradition. Yeah. Yeah, the whole scene though with in the the discussion with all the non men and the king pouring oil on himself. Uh, it was very very cool that whole scene. Crazy. I have to say. And their discussion, it, I did I just imagine it like for the pretty like senile, I guess you how we describe them, but like kind of crazy, deranged, but also like noble in a sense. Very striking. Baker does a good job of making them beautiful and scary. Yeah. And everything feels very claustrophobic no way. inside this yeah. mansion, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts, Steve? I swear. Oh, uh, it's every this on this reread i'm finding more and more that i missed the first time mm. and like uh like dan said there's just so much that it's like hard to keep up with but right the sterbium sections on the first read are very hard right yeah, yeah. i i could not tell especially you especially if you for once or, or what they're gonna be mm -hmm. you need to focus <laughs> good to know yeah <laughs> So don't leave it to the last minute. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I was reading the Ishterabin chapter last, like just a few minutes before we started recording. So I'm I'm pretty sure I missed a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah, very bit. I think I don't know, Carl. I think you mentioned before a bit. The writing is a bit obfuscate. It's not explicitly yeah. not clear in the descriptions. Right. Yeah, I had trouble picturing the throne as it was described, the big non-man throne. I, I yeah. really couldn't. I, 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 yeah, some of the imagery is more clear than others. Like sometimes I'll have like a very simple phrase. That's like a classic thing, you know, like the, you know, the, the way he describes like the, this, a lot of the sci-fi tech, you're like, you know, whether it's like the flying chariot or like the, like weapons of light or whatever, where I'm like, oh yeah, like I see it immediately. But uh... mm, yeah, I find it's like very, like you get very distinct details of certain things, but not a whole picture. 
right? You need to fill in the gaps, I guess, in what you think. And there's so much that it's hard to do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. The, the focus on the seal again, like with the dude in Kilau, just True, that, the seal. Did the seal, was the seal representative of the guy? Because apparently it's a symbol of the kingship. So, and, and we know the guy who came out of hell was also some old king or something. So is that why his representative form was a seal? I swear this part, I don't know if you remember, Steve, but I I don't know what it's supposed to, what am I, am I supposed to remember here or recognize? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, there's... Because the way it's mentioned, it feels like I'm supposed to do like, ah, I see. <laughs> but it's a lot of that, that happens a lot, like, especially in the second the second series, there's a lot of things that I was like, I feel yeah. like I should know what that means, and I don't remember <laughs> yeah, what that I forgot. <laughs> yeah. And like, why a giant seal? Like, is that is that how they stamped their letters using that giant seal? Did they write like really? Did they use tapestries for their mail? Like, what what was this? <laughs> oh, yeah, I I don't know what the hell's going on there. Maybe we'll figure it out. Hopefully. Yes. Ah. <laughs> uh, Quotes. Yes, quotes. Who wants to go first? Steve, of course. That's a silly question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sorry, go ahead. Page 149. The whore will carry you through wars and famine and glory only to drown you for tripping in a ditch. Yeah. True. Very true. Maybe that's how Kellis dies. <laughs> In a ditch. Maybe if a, a, yeah, maybe if a white black warrior drops like a banana peel. And uh, that's how. <laughs> <laughs> he finally yes. gets a bad shrink and gets uh Yeah. Gets uh, an infection. Like food poisoning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the librarian. Hmm? When did we read about the librarian? Oh yeah, the the guy that Kel Mumis. Yeah. Tries to. <laughs> uh yeah, I I forgot about that bit. The the librarian that Kelmo terrorizes. Yeah, I like how Mimara used Akamian's own reasoning to convince him to be safe. Like this place is Dunye. <laughs> <laughs> she gets it now. Yeah. Like... What else? Any other quotes? Anybody else? Any interesting epigraphs? I feel like I understood the epigraphs a lot less in this book and perhaps this series than in the first first series overall. Mm. Are there any that are like standing out more to you guys on a reread? Yeah, I think what like once you have an idea of what's going to happen in the chapter, it like, make a little bit more sense. Mm. That's yeah, that's interesting. That's a good point. Um, one thing I will say about that I am noticing that it's it's definitely hitting me. I think I would notice whether or not I knew that there was no editor um, on these last two books is italics are way overused. Like I used to feel like he was really good at like being like a very pointed use of italics, but it's like every paragraph we have like multiple italicized like emphasized moments that I just like feel like it gets distracting mm -hmm. after a while. Um, and I, and I don't feel like everything, like there's sometimes it's italicizing something that's like, it's like trying to, you know, he wants it to feel really intense, but there are some times where I feel like it's actually undercutting it by like trying to draw too much attention to it. Um, and it's, it's interesting just noticing that writing tick of his that like, I can just imagine that all of his 
first drafts are just filled with these, you know, italicized <laughs> section after italicized section. Um, but I mean, otherwise, I, I you know, I, I quite enjoy the prose and, you know, seeing I guess it we're getting more raw Baker, Baker, right? Yeah. With all his mistakes and everything else. Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. you'll definitely see more in the last two books, more of his vices or something in the way he writes. <laughs> it definitely feels very, yeah, between the, the, the italics and then like the occasional scene where I just have yeah. genuinely no idea what's happening, yeah. you know, where it's like, it feels like this is, this is too much obfuscation. Um, like, I definitely felt, I, I don't know that there was ever a single scene in the original trilogy. Like, there were scenes where it was like, okay, I don't understand exactly the motivations or, like, all the details going on. But, like, I could mm -hmm. generally follow the events, you know? Like, in the same way, I kind of feel that with the kind of court scene we have here it, it, with the non-men. Where, like, I can follow the narrative here, right? Like, I, I can see what's yeah. going on here. And then you have like some of the the head on the pole scenes, which I'm sure like have purpose, but are just written in such a way that it's like I get nothing yeah. out of this. Like I I don't. There's it's kind of a mood piece yeah. for me, but like I don't know. You I know, can I can't see how it. they're supposed to be anything but something for someone reading. Like it it makes no sense. You yeah. can't yeah. understand them the first time unless you're got magical prediction powers or something. Right. You're the white luck warrior. Yeah. You see all time at once. You know, yeah, it's that's, like that's impossible what to know. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think like the first series. I don't think you need to read it. Like, there's not as much of that. Well, the second series, it's kind of like you, you could possibly just finish it and then just read the second series. Way more than the first series. Oh, you mean don't reread really the first series like it's not you necessary can. then? It just there's less of those things mm. in it. It's more it's more straightforward, right? It's mm. not quite as dense. Yeah. Too. Yeah. That's fair. So I found. Next... Oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Marsha. Oh, I was gonna say I found another quote that I wanted to share, but then I oh I found it I found it. Uh... <laughs> Uh, this was describing Kellis Pro's interaction. And he was shadow play, his disciple. The light of cosmic enormities bent small across the surface of a tear. He was an oak leaf, riding the yaw and twizzle of drafts, hanging above the rumor of whirlwinds. Again, <laughs> beautiful. No idea what it means. But I love <laughs> how those words are put together. It sounds really pretty. Yeah. Which is a strange thing for it to feel because of what he's doing to Proyas <laughs> in this scene. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I think the Proyas Kellis chapter is one of my favorite of the book. But it's like this particular, this particular one, one, or like I think all it's the very, mm. very good, very keeps you really in there. There's a lot of beautiful language. There's a lot to think about. It's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. For it sure. Was really good. Yeah, I agree. I like when I'm reading a book when I'm sleepy, and then it just <laughs> wakes me up. <laughs> this this chapter did that. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other quotes to share, or any other final thoughts before we close up? I guess next week, uh, eight through eleven. Eight through eleven. Eight through eleven. Is that about some of it right? I. I think we might be able to go up to 12. Oh, okay. 11 is really short. Yeah. Or, yeah. How long? Oh, shit. How long is chapter 12? Oh, my God. 12 is, so it brings us up to page 334. So, a, like about 125 that? pages. Mm. We could also stop at 11 like that. Either work. We, we can decide. Uh, how long is after that? Um... Oh, 334. Yeah, I guess it just depends. Oh, well, it would probably be a big final chunk. So yeah, through 11, I think makes sense. Because this is, this book is like 500 pages. So yeah. Okay, let's do up to 11 next week. Up to 11, including so, 11? 
Okay, okay. Three, yeah, three through okay. eleven. Reading, yeah. reading eleven. Just stop I always get confused. Okay. Me too. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Me too. Okay. So, outros. Steve. Sure. Uh, find me on PageStream.com or all the other podcasts that we are on. All the different PageStream podcasts are speculative <laughs> speculations. <laughs> Dan. Find me at page wing, the Enfire 17. Uh, yeah, you can find me on social media at Carl D. Albert or uh, on page chewing. I believe I am also Carl D. Albert there. Oh, my. No, Dan. No. Oh, no, Dan. Dan already went. Sorry, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me on the YouTube channel Reading by the Rainy Mountain on the Speculative Speculations podcast. And haunting the Patreon forums. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next week with up to chapter 11. <laughs> Bye.